So just, just a little bit about the webinar. We've disabled the chat and um, sharing your screen or talking, but uh, the Q&A on the bottom is active. We'd like this to be as interactive as possible and to have you know as, as much participation and questions. Um, my name is Dan McRae. I'm the Director of Labor Relations Programs at the Cornell IOR School, Scheinman Institute on Conflict Resolution. My work um, deals primarily probably more over the last 10 years on the management side, although union folks come to our New York City uh, programs at 51st and Lexington. These are professional programs in how to do collective bargaining and contract administration and also working at organizations uh, doing what we call on-sites. Um, and as I said, about 20, 30% are union folks who come to the program, so most of it's management. Um, over here on my going counterclockwise, from what I can see is Arthur Wheaton, who's the director of the labor studies programs, also at Cornell ILR School, the Buffalo CoLab, and also works with us here at the Scheinman Institute. Um, he's primarily or exclusively teaches union programs out of Buffalo in person, as well as a great online uh, program for union folks who want to learn about um, you know, doing collective bargaining, contract administration, and stuff like that. Uh, and our boss, Harry Katz, is to my right. He's the Jack Schenkman Professor of Collective Bargaining at the ILR School. He's the director of the Scheinman Institute. Um, he was our dean and uh, interim uh, provost, and he has a, a great deal of experience. He teaches labor relations and also has worked with organizations and unions and stuff like that. So we're going to start with art, right? So art, we talked about union militancy. Um and the, the rise or heightened union militancy. Can you tell us a little bit from the union's perspective, from the worker's perspective, you know, what's what's going on? Like where 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 were we 10 years ago, five years ago, three years ago, whatever you want, and, and where are we now? Well, I, I think we've seen a big growth in terms of activity. So if you want to call <clears throat> that activity, you want to call it militancy, you're at least seeing a lot, a lot more um activity in the unions trying to organize unions going out on strike i think in terms of having the the stronger feelings or the stronger militancy i would put back to starbucks and starbucks really started kicking off the organizing i happen to be in buffalo buffalo is where that kicked off for the first starbucks to organize and you saw an incredible reaction from Starbucks being heavily anti-union, which created a lot of conversations and a lot of things going on. There were certainly activities before that and after that, but I think in terms of the getting the awareness of unions and what's happening really spiked during the Starbucks organizing. Now they've got like 360 different Starbucks that have a union and they have exactly zero contracts. So you're seeing that the the fight. So the militancy is because sometimes it takes two to tango and you've seen a lot of aggressive action by management, whether it was at Amazon or whether it was at Starbucks. And I think that's part of it. I think what you're seeing currently is tr people trying to come back from COVID and coming back from high inflation well, and yeah, really was... trying to demand bigger, bigger changes. Yeah, so that's what I was going to ask you. So maybe militancy in a, in a few places, but what you're really seeing is activity and interest. I mean, we can call it militancy, as you said. So what, so why, why, so do you think it's different now or is it sort of much ado about nothing, same old, same old? So do you think the last couple of years have been different or it's different now than it was a couple of years ago and why? I think the biggest reason that it's happening now is the labor market or the environment for jobs is good. And you had high inflation. So people whose contracts expired or had contracts for the last three or four years, their contracts are expiring. And now they're trying to get all of those gains back. So we saw some very big changes in our environment for both the economy, for government, for COVID. And now is the opportunity to negotiate those changes. And I think it's also important to remember that, according to Gallup, we're near all-time highs for favorability for unions. We're at about 70% of the general public is in favor of unions. And it's easier to get a job now because the unemployment rate is much lower. And I think it takes away some of the sting or the risk for trying to, to go out on strike or be tougher in negotiations. 
I, I just want to build on it. I think, Art, you, you've raised a number of really important factors, and I think you've only alluded to the other one, which is um, workers feeling that they deserve payback for being the ones that had to keep working during the pandemic. I keep reminding my students that I didn't have to go to work in June of 2020 when the COVID uh, pandemic was widespread. Automobile workers on the assembly lines did. UPS truck drivers did. People in other service occupations, whether they're at Starbucks cafes or in the postal service or nurses, they all had to go back to work, uh, risking their own health, the health of their family, and they want payback. You know, they feel they deserve uh, something above and beyond. For a while, some firms, as many of us know, were offering sort of little bonuses for workers for having to work during the pandemic, but most of those ended. And that reinforces all, all the things you mentioned, I think are important too. We shouldn't forget the strength of the labor market and all, but remember this is also a somewhat different moment because uh, workers who had to go back on the line during the height of the pandemic want payback. Yeah, I think part of that too is that work-life balance that I think that during those that were what they, you know, called, you know, mandatory services or they couldn't get out of it. E essential workers was the term that was used. Many of them were working tons of overtime. So if they had to work, they weren't just working, they were working a lot. And you saw that in the railway sector, that it wasn't the money that was the cause of the major disagreements between the union and the companies. It was absolutely about having pay time off or attendance policies. So it's that work-life balance in addition to, to all of those things. But I think there's a lot of factors and they all hit at once. And, and do you think the industries that are that do have more, I mean, unionization, as Harry's probably going to mention this, unionization has declined dramatically. I think we're at 11% of the workforce, 7% in the private sector. Do you think they're concentrated more in areas where people have to come to work? In your experience? I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's concentrated just in there, because I think you're seeing it's spread, spread around a lot of different industries, especially if you're thinking about government sector, there's quite a few people in the public sector that are belonging to unions. Um, so that's, it's certainly part of it, but it, I don't think that explains everything. Yeah, well, so Ray, you're absolutely right. Public sector, a lot of people could work from home, but we see healthcare is concentrated utilities are concentrated i guess the customer service people could work from from work from home manufacturing where it is certainly the U, uaw and stuff like that but what about the people who didn't you know who weren't necessarily being forced to come to work during covid and wanting payback are you seeing increased interest in unions and and why might that be true these days i think it I think there's a lot of strength in collective bargaining, which is why we've been studying it, that if you get a union to be able to help you, it gives you a voice in the workplace and you're able to have a group of people fight and try to argue and try to convince the employer to give you more. And I think there's some comfort in knowing that you're not alone and that you have people to try to fight for that. But I think Harry's got more to add on that point. No, I would just also add into what you said, the fact that this building resentment of uh, income inequality, that's the other sort of somewhat unique factor we have now versus 30 years ago is all the attention that's been drawn to the incredible inequality that's emerged both in income and wealth, you know, all the, the rich billionaires, whether it's Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos or others, they're doing well, the executives are doing well. And as you said, workers are struggling, facing very high inflation on food and gas prices. So that's also the other background factor that's somewhat different. Although it was building for many years, it just seems to have brought heightened awareness and, and more interest in, in unions or other forms of collective action. I think we also ought to remember, we see more collective action even where there are unions. You know, we have the latest example of, of, of pharmacists and Walgreens going out. We had an example of Google, a group who called themselves a union. They're not a real union, but the 200, 300 employees banding together, protesting the way uh, top managers were getting golden parachutes, even after accusations of sexual harassment arose, concerns about contract labor at Google and other tech companies. So that's the other kind of interesting thing going on now is collective action. Has, has risen in intensity, even when it doesn't involve unions and collective bargaining agreements. 
Yeah, I would think you could go to the fight for 15, the Occupy Wall Street, and whether it was Black Lives Matter, there's just been a lot of different social activity where you're doing group protest or groups trying to fight or advocate for something. And for so many years, people were saying $15, that's ridiculous. You can't have $15. We'd all go bankrupt. And now they're all fast food and everybody else is paying 15 and California is going to go to 20 for the ma mandatory minimum wage for the hospitality sector or for restaurants. So it, it does make a difference. I think you're seeing a lot of activism. And I think one other important point, or at least significant point, is who's in the office for the president. And by having a more democratic or a more labor friendly um administration, you're seeing changes in the National Labor Relations Board, which means that if this case does go to court or you do have fighting for unfair labor practices, which were more than 100 at Starbucks, um, you will you will get better recognition of those types of issues in the courts or the National Labor Relations Board system. So I think it does tend to make a difference if you're seen as having your voices being heard and getting a fair hearing. Yeah, and and the the National Labor Relations Board has made it easier um, to organize, and and many of people will know about the recent decision in August, um, Semex, that um, gives the board, as long as upheld by the court, more power to basically certify a union without an election. Although it's still hard to do something about slow rolling the negotiations, right? It seems like Starbucks is just waiting. Amazon is just waiting. I think it's harder for the board to do something unilateral. They can't give a contract. They can order a union maybe, but they can't order a contract. So that's still a strategy for them. But Art, can you talk a little bit more about inflation and the profitability of these companies and cola, the rise of cola? What is? I know Coca-Cola, but what is cola, right? People might not be aware of that and maybe talk and then I'll, I'll move on to Harry a little bit about UAW and UPS and cola and, and or just inflation or just your thoughts about what's going on in Detroit and that kind of stuff. Sure. So cola is cost of living adjustment or sometimes referred to cost of living agreements, depending on how they want to phrase it. And it means whatever the inflation rate is that your wage will automatically go up by that percentage. So if the inflation rate last year was close to eight or nine percent, then you would automatically get a raise of eight or nine percent. And for auto industry, which I tend to study quite a bit, you had over the last four years, the price of cars have gone up about 30 percent. But the wages for the auto workers has only gone up six percent. So they got a three percent raise in one of the years and a three percent in another. In two of the years, they get just got lump sums. They did not get a pay increase. So they're fighting very hard to try to get their cost of living adjustments or agreements back in place, which they had for like 50 years. And it got taken away during the Great Recession and some of the bankruptcies at GM and what is now Stellantis so that they're fighting to have those automatic. Everyone on Social Security also has the same thing. So the same exact measure they use for inflation for these cost of living adjustments, they use what's called the CPIW or Consumer Price Index for urban and wage earners. That tells you um, what that inflation rate is for people who are working. So that's the exact same thing. You can go to Social Security website and find all of that data and information for how much it's gone up. And the auto workers have come nowhere close to keeping up with the rate of inflation for the last, I would say, 20 years. They're not even close to keeping up. Right. And so just so people remember, think about this, because for those of us doing labor relations over the last 10 or 20 years, it was different than in the past where the social contract was you employer give us ever increasing living standards and we will ensure labor peace, we'll ensure compliance. And so COLA, the idea that you would get the inflation rate, that's automatic. We don't get increasing living standards just by getting the CPIW. We get that and a wage increase. And so in 1979, when unemployment was 14%, you could have in your contract, which was common at the time, COLA, and then a scheduled general wage increase of let's say five or 6%. So people were getting 20% wage increases in 1979. Um, maybe Harry will talk about, or we can talk about that freaked out. I mean, that was a big hit on the employer community and may have in part driven 
the union avoidance movement in part. Um, but you're saying they're they're coming back, and you know, over the last ten years before the before COVID, it was sort of typical when unions were getting increases, they were just getting inflation. They were just keeping up with inflation. They were benchmarking it, and it was low. It was two percent or whatever it was. Um, and now unions are coming back and saying, no, we got to make up for the inflation. And then we get on top of that. Yeah. General Motors back in about 1948, it was the president of General Motors said, I'm tired of having these strikes every year. We're just going to give you these raises for this cost of living. And on top of that, what they referred to it was, was an annual improvement factor. So it's exactly what you're talking about. The percentage sometimes change, but they figured you need the cost of living. Yes. And we'll give you about three or 4% on top of that for your productivity gains. And all of those things have gone away. And now it's a fight just to try to keep up. And it's it's enough where people are willing to be out on strike or at least try significantly hard at the bargaining table to win them back. But I think it's time to move on to Harry. All right, Harry. Well, uh, uh, I just want to also put this in a bit of historical uh, context and do so by uh, mentioning a data series that's being reported by the ILR school by Professor Eli Friedman and Johnny Callis. It's something called the Labor Action Tracker, and it's been keeping track over the last three years of any type of labor action, whatever the number of workers involved, whether they're in unions or not. And, and that's an improvement over uh, the series we you know, used to rely on from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. I won't go into all the details, but that tracked only large strikes and only those uh, where unions were involved. Anyway, what, what, what does the labor action tracker show? Uh, it shows us two key things. One is the level of militancy, as we're all talking about, we read about in the newspaper, and you may all, uh, those uh, who are participating, may be experiencing it at your workplaces. Yes, the amount of labor action has gone up uh, significantly in the last year and a half, especially compared to, as best we can tell, uh, the period uh, of five to 10 years before them. However, here's the other point that that data series shows us. By the way, if you wanted a particular data on your industry or sector or other issues about what were these labor actions about, we're generalizing, but you can find lots of detailed information in that labor action tracker from the ILR school. In any case, the second thing it shows is yes, the level of labor action has gone up, but compared uh, to action in the 1960s, 70s, and even the first half of the 1980s, the number of strikes and other kinds of impasses is still now significantly lower than it was during earlier periods. Even taking account, as Dan's mentioned, in the overall decline in the number of negotiations occurring because the share of the workforce, particularly in the private sector, has that's union has declined. Even correcting for that, you still find, even with this increase in labor actions of one sort or another, many fewer impasses than we've had in other periods. So keep that in the back of your head. This, this is not Armageddon, though there clearly is something going on now that's different from the past five, uh, 10 or 20, 20 years. Um, each case differs. I do want to sort of mention something else we're going to do that the uh, people participating may be interested in. Here we're kind of generalizing, jumping between cases and industries. We're going to have uh, webinars where we in each one specifically talk about a key negotiation. Uh, and, that, and that'll be the following. In, in early November, uh, we think that will be November 3rd at 1 p.m., but stay tuned with our Scheinman website for the details uh, on that. We're gonna have someone from the Writers Guild, one of the lead negotiators, uh, talk to us about what was achieved in the recent settlement that settled the dispute, five month long dispute involving the writers in Hollywood and the major studios and other uh, outlets, uh, uh, producers of, of uh, movies and, and TV shows. Um, uh, we'll have a commentator from our faculty, Adam Litwin. You may have seen a really interesting opinion piece Adam produced that appeared uh, in the New York Times about what was achieved in that negotiation. Uh, then in the middle of November, uh, we, we're gonna uh, focus on the auto dispute, whether or not it's been settled, the strike that's going on now involving the so-called big three. Stellantis, uh, Ford, and GM. Uh, we'll have a webinar focused on that. And then in early December, 
uh, we'll, we'll focus on the Kaiser Permanente recent and seemingly ongoing uh, strike uh, uh, and other disputes occurring uh, in healthcare. So stay tuned for that. Um, the only other thing I just want to add is um, that Art was was right, and Dan's reinforced that, and I'm sure you you felt that in your own dealings with labor, that part of the militancy strength of labor comes from the fact that the labor market is tighter. Uh, workers and unions have more bargaining power in such a period, just like they have historically. Historically, over the business cycle, even with the downward trend overall in unionization of the private sector, when, when there was a tight labor market, unions and workers did better. They were better at organizing and they had more significant wage and benefit gains during those uh, periods. So the, part of the explanation then is that. But at the same time, we also need to be thinking about the following case. And we'll get into this more in these three follow-up uh, webinars. And that is, uh, yes, workers have more power now. So that should lead to more favorable settlements as it had in a number of instances but why does that lead to impasses? In other words, shouldn't management anticipate that labor has more power? Uh, we all talk about the fact that strikes uh, uh, lead to costly income losses to both sides. Just think about the riders. They've lost five months of earnings. The studios have lost money. So why don't the parties reach agreement and not go through the strike? Why don't they anticipate more fully what they're gonna settle on and there are gains they could share between them that could make both sides better off and all. Um, well, in fact, here's the other thing we should note about the history is most often the parties do reach agreement. The press and we all, we focus a lot on the cases that go to impasse. Historically, 95% of collective bargaining negotiations reach agreement without an impasse. And we have some recent examples. The Teamsters have a lot more power representing workers at the United Parcel Service, UPS, in this round of negotiations, right? You can't replace 320,000 angry uh, Teamster drivers and warehouse workers easily. They have a strong union coalesced around a strong leader, Sean O'Brien, and they had a lot of bargaining power. And some people speculated, oh, that means there's going to be a really long, difficult strike. There wasn't. There was a settlement, a very favorable settlement in line with the increased bargaining power labor had, but not necessarily uh, leading to a strike. And there are many other examples, you don't hear about them as much in the press, even now in which negotiations are leading to settlements without impasse. And so as we delve deeper into particular cases, we should always be thinking, yes, maybe we understand why it is that labor is doing better now, but we don't always have a good explanation as to why in some cases they reach an impasse, in other cases they're willing to negotiate. I'll just quickly throw out my own pet uh, theory about what's happening now. And that is labor's power has risen as we've been talking about, you've all experienced from what it was 20 and 30 years ago. I don't think management in all cases has fully anticipated and recognized how much more power has shifted to labor. And so that can help us understand why there's an impasse the impasse is a process in which management has to learn, come to grips with the fact that labor has more power and up the offer. And in some of the negotiations, whether they've reached impasse or not, when you track what the offers have been over time, management has substantially raised the offer uh, as a result of the strike action. And that signals that management wasn't fully anticipating how much leverage labor had. I'll stop at that. Yeah, so go ahead, Art. Yeah, I was just going to answer the question. Uh, Maria wrote a great question about what would be an example of an impasse in similar cases in the past. I think sometimes terminology is new for some folks that the impasse means that the union and the management can't come together with an agreement. They say they're stuck or they're blocked on trying to get that resolution. So when Harry's talking about an impasse, you have a couple options. One is you just extend the contract and keep negotiating. So when the contract expires, you can extend the contract, keep negotiating, or management can lock you out. So in the professional sports, you've seen more lockouts than you have strikes because management chooses not to let the, the union go to work and then you can have the strike. So in the past, all of those cases have been done and a lot of the strikes slowed down a bit 
uh, under Ronald Reagan and the air traffic controllers for PATCO, where they fired everybody and said, you can't work for the federal government again. So there was some, somewhat of a cooling or chilling effect on the people willing to risk a strike. Now with such a low unemployment rate and a tight labor market, there's less risk for being on strike because there are alternatives. But impasse just means you can't get an agreement. You're you're stuck. You're blocked. You're not making progress. So I, I just wanted to make sure that was clear. Great question, Maria. So, Harry, I have a, just a question for you, and then I'll sort of give my thoughts based on my experience over the last 12 years here. But um, let me let me play the devil's advocate in the sense of is it really going to. Yes, workers have more power in places. There's more collective action, even if it's not unionization fight for 15, et cetera. But do you expect union density really to increase? Maybe you can talk about why did it decline? And you know, do you really think that it's gonna change um, much? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I'm curious about what, what you and are thinking, also other participants who are looking in. Uh, I'm, I'm not convinced we're in the, in the midst of a revolution <laughs> in terms of, union success at organizing. As, as you described and mentioned that private sector unionization is down even now below the 7% figure, it's somewhere around six and a half. Public sector unionism, very different story. That stayed up around 33, 34% unionized. So as, as we've been talking about, there's been more unionization, more militancy, the Starbucks cafes, the one warehouse of Amazon on Staten Island. Um, but we don't see a, a widespread phenomenon that leads to really massive unionization or anything that compares to what happened in the late 1930s or other periods when there was a massive growth in private sector unionism. The, the, it, it, it's really unclear if uh, what's happening now with all the things we've been talking about, the change in public attitudes and approval of unions, strengthening in the labor market, it's not at all clear that's gonna lead or is leading to a massive significant increase in private sector unionism. Now, why? I mean, Art's mentioned it in part, look at the case of Starbucks and the Amazon warehouse. Workers unionized and they didn't have enough bargaining leverage to gain a first contract. Historically, that's been true. 40% of, of first uh, contract negotiations don't end with a collective bargaining agreement over the first four or five years. Uh, data from Kate Roffenbrenner and our faculty and others show that. So I think you've got to ask, and I'm, I'm interested in your own views, has, has labor's power really so profoundly increased beyond the business cycle effect? And there, I'm not so sure. Globalization, the growth of the non-union South. Um, again, we'll come back to this in the auto sector in our more tailored uh, webinar. I keep reminding people that now more than 50% of the cars and trucks sold in the United States this year are not assembled by UAW labor. Uh, they used to control the industry uh, with 100% representation across the big three, whether it's imports, the transplants, and then there's the supplier sector. We hear about the fight over the EV battery plants, but there's been a massive growth of non-union operation in the auto supplier sector. And that's true, even though the scale may be a little bit different in many other industries. So back to your point, I'm not so sure we're in the midst of a massive upsurge in private sector unionism. We certainly have more energy, more militants, more activity, but it's not clear yet whether this is just a short run business cycle effect due to the tightening labor market that Art's been mentioning, or whether there's a structural historical change that in any way compares to the periods in the past when unionism in the private sector grew more substantially. Yeah, and I just go back to the point I was making. The law is, it, it, from the perspective of getting more unions, if that's what you want, the NLRA is flawed. I mean, at least for now, the employers have been able to figure out, so long as we can maintain production for a period of time, we can just wait them out. And I'm not sure there's much the NLRB, even under Democratic board, through interpretive power, right? Because they're there to interpret the law, not make the law. They have some good arguments that they could force you if you committed an unfair labor practice to recognize the union. But there's not much there that would give them the power to say, you know what, you've been stringing them along for so long, even if it's bad faith bargaining and employers know how to avoid that, they just bargain hard, they don't technically bargain in bad faith. Um, but even if it was bad faith bargaining, the, the NLRB doesn't really have the power to order a contract. They just, you know, or even significant remedies. 
Um, and that's the interesting thing. I think the UPS, the, the, the one argument about why UPS didn't strike is they want to go organize, the, the Teamsters want to go organize the Amazon drivers. And so they wanted to get that $16 an hour part timers up, get the wages up, but without a costly strike, because it's it's hard to go to a place and say, you know, we'll give you these benefits, but you're going to have to strike for a long time to get it. Um, and so that's, you know, again, if coming out of the strike, the UAW can show we can get you an extra $20, $30 an hour, you know, at Tesla or something like that, maybe that'll be enough. But if they don't, if they can organize those places, then they've just dramatically increased the cost to the last bastion of concentrated unionized manufacturing in the country. And then people just start buying Teslas or whatever they already are. Yeah. yeah. No, I just want to add too. you make a good point. It's, it's and it's not just at Starbucks and Amazon, the ones we hear about in the press. There, there are major employers uh, who faced organizing drives over the last five, 10 years. And that's continuing in many locations who uh, uh, win, win those uh, campaigns, and whether they win because there's weaknesses in the law that have tipped the playing field too much in management's favor, or they win because of other factors. For example, right? look at the UAW's effort to try and organize Volkswagen in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Many of us, I'd certainly say myself, I thought that campaign was going to succeed. It was going to be the place the UAW could cr crack the nut and begin to organize the transplant. Initially, VW did not aggressively oppose the union, in part because of pressure from the union in Germany, e.g. Mattel. And yet the, the UAW lost that campaign. They've lost it in many other efforts to organize assembly plants in the transplant. The Boeing uh, case, Boeing was producing its planes, the Dreamliner and others in Seattle and that region. They opened a factory several years ago in, in Charleston, South Carolina, uh, the machinist, God bless him, ran, you know, ran an organizing effort there, and it didn't succeed. Now, you could say, oh, it's all because of the law, but maybe there's other things that may combine with the law. For example, what we hear are reports that, yes, the, the wage in many of these places is not as high as the top wage in the organized sites, but it's still a, substantially above the local wage. So those VW workers working in Chattanooga Yes, they weren't earning as much in terms of wage and benefits as the Detroit UAW workers, but they're earning a lot more than the alternative wages. We've heard reports from the Bessemer Alabama Amazon warehouse, flipping back to that case, where again, we thought, oh, a really sincere effort by the union involved the retail, wholesale, what workers, RWDS, a really strong campaign uh, linked to community groups recognizing the fact that uh, many of the workers were people of color and had issues regarding how they were treated because of that. Again, many of us thought, oh, this is finally gonna crack the nut. And again, it failed. And some people will say, oh, it's all because the law, but maybe it's other things going on too. Again, Amazon maybe not, may not be paying those warehouse workers in Alabama everything we wish they, were, they would pay, but they're paying enough uh, to dissuade workers from going through the risk, as you put it, of a strike or other conflicts that might emerge. So labor is still struggling, what I'm getting at, is still struggling to figure out a way to do just what your question asks. How can they take advantage of the current condition to substantially improve unionization, success, and organizing in the private sector? The jury is still out on whether they can ac accomplish that, and whether this is just a blip, uh, or is really a historical turning point. I don't know, Art, what do you think about all that? I, I think you made a lot of great points. And I think if you talk about the Chattanooga um, Volkswagen, part of it was having people that the National Labor Relations Act never considered, that you active, actively had government and elected officials interfering in an election, which is not a violation of the law because they never anticipated that the politicians would say, you'll never get another dime from a federal or public funding from us if you organize a union here. And a lot of the right to work state money from outsiders pouring into those communities to try to block some of that organizing effort. So there was a lot of funding in, from folks who are opposed to unions uh, that were interfering there. And I think that's the case for South Carolina as well, for Boeing and probably for Bessemer, Alabama as well. But I had a great question for one of my favorite students, Sarah Labar, 
I asked a question about historical change. So how crucial is the 2024 election? So we're, we're talking about what's happening in politics, getting involved in labor for those drives, um, for keeping the labor movement open. I think there's been some initiatives in the past, going back to Bill Clinton, trying to make changes to labor law. Um, Employee Free Choice Act was a, something under Obama, and now you've got what's called the PRO Act, which is trying to get done. But it's difficult to get things passed in a divided Congress. So without 60 senators, it's very difficult. It does make a difference for the 2024 election of whether it's a Democrat or a Republican um, in terms of who gets appointed to the NLRB. And some of that, it's unfortunate, but it has become a little bit more political in terms of those NLRB positions. I think it's I think it's kind of clear in terms of this election cycle where you had both President Biden on a strike picket line for the UAW advocating for the unions. And then you had the Republican leading uh, candidate, former President Trump, in a non-union plant trying to advocate for things for in a non-union parts plan. So I think the election does have a, a significance, but I don't know whether it is a critical significance at this point. The labor movement's been around long enough. We will survive in terms of fighting for people's rights, but it certainly makes it easier if you have a more favorable yeah. um, administration. Can I just add one other thing before Daniel Andrews, and that is, um, you know, keep in mind, as, as Art mentioned, the, the public's approval rating towards unions and collective bargaining has gone up substantially from what it's been in the last 25 years, and particularly strong among the younger uh, workers. Now, what that leads me to, to, to see is that it helps me understand why, uh, even with the federal labor law paralysis that Art mentioned, the, the inability of the labor movement with the Democratic Party to get a really favorable change in the labor laws. That's failed this time, as well as having failed in other administrations. What you do see is some initiatives being passed, and Dan's mentioned one, at the local level, at state and city levels, whether it's in New York City or Seattle or in California, Art mentioned too, the fast food workers in California, a bill just got passed you know, setting up a new review board, recommending standards, raising the minimum to $20 an hour. So you see uh, unions being more successful at the state and local levels than they've been at the federal level. And where does that success come from? I think it comes from, in part, the improvement in public approval, the attitudes uh, that prevail regarding unions and collective bargaining. So I think it's a great question to ask and speculate what might happen at the federal level but don't let us lose sight of what's already happening at the local uh, uh, and uh, city and, and state level. Hospitality workers in, L in LA, they've successfully lobbied for legislation to set you know, uh, room levels and standards for housekeepers and other rules that have passed in various cities, including New York, about Uber and taxi drivers and all. Those things are really important, even though they're not uh, involved uh, with a federal uh, legislative uh, change. Yeah, I would add, Harry, back to your point about the jury still out of union density. So, yeah, as Art said, the outsiders, I think it was Senator Corker who said in the Chattanooga case, oh, I've heard if they unionize, they're going to move to Mexico, which would be illegal if the employer threatened that, but a third party can. But is there something else going on there? I mean, one, let's just face it, that the, the employer's have learned how to do this, right? They've learned how to both the illegal, but passes as legal, but also the, the negative side of union voids, but also the positive side. So the negative side is, we'll just fire the rabble rousers. We'll, we have very good systems of intelligence of who's talking about their working conditions, who's trying to organize, and we'll just terminate them. It's, that's illegal, but that's not the reason they give for terminating them. But then also something, Harry, that you've mentioned that modern human resource management has been a factor, right? Because it used to be if you were being discriminated against based on the color of your skin or your gender, you had to form a union because you just didn't have anywhere else to go. And so that's the positive side of the positive labor relations, sort of manage like you have a union in order to avoid a union. Um, 
And so the question, but again, I think the big thing will be Tesla, right? I'm not sure can Tesla close down its Fremont plant for six months? <laughs> Where will they build the cars? And so we'll see coming out of the UAW whether they're able to to change to change the 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 game here. So well, we certainly were you know wondering the same thing in Amazon. We thought, oh, the that independent Amazon workers union led by this bold figure, Chris Smalls, organizes 8,000 warehouse workers in Staten Island. And again, a number of us thought, oh, let's go see what's going to happen next in Alabama at the neighboring warehouse in Staten Island, at the warehouses in Albany, New York, and in California. And we haven't seen uh, an upsurge in, in union success there in those other places. Yes, as Arts pointed out, we have over 350 Starbucks cafes unionized. That's that, but is that the exception rather than the rule? And as well, we were all reminding us uh, that they still don't have a first contract. Well, if you look so, at the, you you can go to the NLRB's website and look at the elections and one loss, and you'll see just tons of Starbucks, right? And then you go through the other employers, and they're not very sizable bargaining units. I mean, you're not getting huge, you know, even in the victories, you're not getting huge. And the, the Staten Island, the other Staten Island place voted overwhelmingly against you. I mean, it wasn't even close, right? So yeah, there's something going on there. So here are some of my thoughts of just working with the employer community and, and maybe some advice. So, you know, since 2011, I've been running these programs and a lot of employers have come through the New York City Conference Center as well as doing on sites. And they very much were in that sort of forcing mode right, where we have a lot of bargaining leverage, it's high unemployment, we're coming out of the Great Recession, very sluggish, you know, wage freezes, and continuing with the process of creating tiered employment, right, where, okay, we'll grandfather in the people who were there, but now it's new benefits and wages and stuff for the, for the new people. And as the decades sort of progressed, more and more, I was hearing complaints about skilled labor shortage, skilled labor shortage, right, even before COVID. And also the younger generation and their so-called work ethic, <laughs> right? That the older generation, they really wanted to work and earn that overtime and, and the younger generation just doesn't want to do it. Now, um, I, I, I will warn people, I think every generation says that about the younger generation. I was telling my colleagues, I just saw 12 Angry Men for the first time, um, 1959 classic film. And at the beginning, the jurors are chatting and one person says, ah, the younger generation, they have no work ethic. And that was 1959. But we do know from COVID, all the things that Art and Harry have mentioned, is that there are changes of what people want. And, you know, part of it is the employer's fault to a certain extent overall. Like the younger generation says, you didn't show us parent, our parents any loyalty. Why should we show your parents loyalty? And we don't have the, you know, the defined benefit pension that tied us to the company. You wanted benefits to be portable and cheaper. And so now we'll, we can go around and have choices and things of that sort. Um, and coming out of COVID, people want different things. And part of the the challenge is how do we break out of, for, I'm talking, because we don't do union avoidance. So we don't deal with companies that don't have unions. So it's basically people who have unions who come to us for education. And so I'll just leave with two thoughts and then we can open up to any other questions. So one is to think more creatively about the workplace and the benefits and the, and the total rewards and all the stuff that you provide for the employees. And to break out of sort of the traditional labor management structures of collective bargaining every three to five years and grievance arbitration as the only way of sort of dealing with each other and try to create what we call labor management committees. And there'll be additional series in these webinars about how to create problem solving structures and processes where you really have a continuous conversation with the union about the employee's needs and approach it more from an interest based where you're trying to solve both sides problems as opposed to a rights based which is what what does the contract say oh that's our policy that's our corporate policy right the classic case is you know the the coal miner whose boots are stolen and under the contract that's his responsibility so the employer stands on the rights and say, we're not replacing your boots. You, you, you have to pay for your boots. And then that's like the final straw and there's a strike, right? But more importantly, what's the employer's true interest? Well, they want people to have boots so they can do the work. They just don't want to be like the guy who's selling his boots out of the back of his truck and then coming in. But there's a way you can sort of figure that out, right? And that's a simple example, but having sort of these permanent relationships, you know, how do we build you know, work-life balance, 
Like, how do we do it in a way that meets our needs as the employer as well? And, and, and this is the last piece, which is really to build the capacity around costing and compensation, right? Because we've sort of done it the old way. We have sort of the cookie cutter approach um, sometimes to wages and benefits. And employers are always trying to save money on that, which I completely under, understand. But th there was sort of a, a weirdness in some of our students. I think we're losing Dan. Is it just my internet? Can you hear me, Harry? Can you hear? Yeah. Um, but I'll speak closer to the mic because sometimes that happens. You know, so we would get during COVID in our, our classes, our online class, in-person classes, oh, we can't find workers. We have supply, but we have demand, but we just don't have the supply. People don't want to work the overtime. We can't get people to come in on the weekends when we need, we can't be at full capacity, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so those are your problems. And then we could, okay, what are your bargaining priorities? Oh, cut benefits. <laughs> you know, it's just like there, there was a disconnect there, right? And I think part of the problem is in, in doing this creative is one is capacity and thinking about it, having the skills, to, you know, and costing and compensation. But the other piece is I've asked compensation experts who work with employers a lot. I've asked CHROs, have you really quantified the cost of turnover? Have you really quantified what is the hit to your bottom line in not being able to attract and retain? And almost to the to the person, they say, mm, not really. I mean, there's the standards like, oh, retraining, it costs six months before you get there. You know, there's some sort of rules of thumb. I had one CHR tell me it's not just it's not just retraining. We've lost the knowledge. Like, and we don't even know what we lost, right? Because we don't know what we don't know. Right. And so really to think, because if you come and you say, you know, I was dealing with a, 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 a an employer who was talking about how difficult it was to get people on the weekend. We were talking about different shifts. He's like, well, we'd have to double our staffing and just sort of back of the envelope based on what we I was like, well, it's not doubling your staffing. Right. So one is it's just it's right people being sort of ideological. No, 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 no. We can't increase headcount. No, no. We have to do it with current headcount. Right. So one is costing it out. But the second piece is. You know, in and this is a problem because in your budget, it's going to assume you're going to be successful. As I like to say, corporate communications is the enemy of labor <laughs> communications. You know, you you assume a very rosy sort of picture. We're hitting targets, or whatever, and you haven't costed into your budget the actual risk that because you don't keep the labor, you're not going to meet your targets. So I was dealing with a utility that has all this work that they're going to be doing for greenification and electrification. And one person says, failure is not an option. We can't not do the work. We can't not get the work done. And I said, well, that's definitely what you should say when you're sitting in the C-suite, you know, when someone's testing your ideological commitment to the budget. But of course, failure is an option. Like you could not retain the people, you could not lose the people. But to the CFO, they've already counted that they're going to be successful. And then any changes that I wanna make to increase benefits is just a pure cost as opposed to saying, well, wait a minute, we're mitigating a risk to the budget that actually we won't be able to make the production. We won't be able to do it. And so I think part of it is thinking creatively, having those processes where you can really sit down and think about different employment structures and just being honest, you know, to be the employer of choice, you may need to change certain things. And there may be a short-term hit to your bottom line. I mean, of course there, there would be if you're increasing staffing costs or things of that sort. Maybe you can find some trade-offs and win-wins as well. But if you think more about the risks to you, if you aren't the employer of choice, um, you know, you're you're basically you're it, it's something that you're gonna have to do in order to hit your targets and hit your numbers. And so long as so long as demand is high and we didn't go into a recession, we thought we would, but well, many people thought we would, we didn't. So demand is still high, you're still making money. And so it's far more costly not to sell your stuff than maybe to think a little more creatively about work-life balance or staffing models and things like that. So those I are think, my two cents. Yeah, I, I think uh, I'd like to hear what Harry has to say about the couple of questions that are talking about exactly the same issue there. You had Maria ask uh, some good questions in terms of what's unnecessary conflict a lot of times, if the union cannot get what they need from the bargaining table, it kind of forces some sort of conflict that it's something of value enough or importance enough that you're going to continue to argue and fight for it. And sometimes it's from reluctance of management or 
Sometimes that pressure is needed to get things done. And what are the strategies that unions to organize workers who are now working from home? I think there have been some. I think I'd rather hear Harry's answer on that one and also the diversity, equity, and inclusion piece. So if you can see the questions and answers here, I'd like to hear what your your thoughts on strategies for organizing people that are working from home. I mean, those are all interesting questions. I'm not sure I have answers for them all. And the working from home, keep in mind that something is changing in the ability of workers to communicate with one another through social media in a way that was different from the past. And so that may lead, may lead to some collective actions occurring, even though workers are working in a more dispersed fashion. At the same time, what we've also seen Management is not stupid. Management has also learned how to make use of social media to communicate with the workforce. Just going back to some of the campaigns we mentioned, whether it's been in Bessemer, Alabama at Amazon's warehouse or at the various uh, factories UAW is trying to organize or different healthcare organizing, you know, or at Boeing, the case I've also studied closely, management is taking advantage of communicating through social media. Let me give you the Boeing example. Boeing in its negotiations with the strong unions, God bless them, in, in the Seattle area, when Boeing's bargaining, they bargain as they should uh, across the table and they provide their offers to their union counterparts. That's complying with the law, as Dan's pointed out, the obligation to bargain in good faith. But they also have a program going on the internet in which every time they improve their offer, state their offer at the, on the table, they follow it up by showing workers how it would directly affect their earnings given their earning level and years of seniority. So whether it's the worker or their spouse partner can now see on the internet what's being offered by management. That's just one example. So again, management is taking advantage more social media. It remains to be seen. It's a great question. As more, more of us we only require our staff to come into the office nine days a month. And all if that's going on in places where there isn't a union, will that make it harder for the union to form? Or will they find ways around it? Just quickly, your question about what's unnecessary conflict. It seems to me conflicts in which the there was a, a substantial loss of income by labor and management, not always the same amount of loss, but substantial losses of income that could have been avoided through more problem-solving approaches of the sort Dan's mentioning and building on that, problem-solving approaches in the labor management relationship where you don't have miscommunication, miscalculation, and you can also try and pursue more integrative win-win solutions and how to adapt to technology, how to change work schedules, how to meet the needs of workers who are concerned about occupational health, for example, in a way they haven't been in the past. There's lots of opportunity for that and potentially uh, pursuing those kind of channels can reduce the likelihood of an impasse. My instinct on the DNI thing, and, and I'll be interesting to get some data on this. I'm not sure it, I mean, it, it certainly could hurt unions for the reasons that was stated in Marie's question, but I have the sense that this is a source of potential conflict, right? The greater expectations around these issues in the employment setting and might be encouraging people to organize collectively because their employers may not be doing, I mean, right, the employers that do a knockout great job on this, just like with human resource management and conflict resolution, sure, they avoid a union, but a lot of employers don't do a good job <laughs> of it. And so the expectations are raised and then they're already meeting to discuss workplace issues with groups of people. And I think it could include, um, it could encourage the, the collective action. On the amicable relationships, that's an interesting question again about the data. I mean, the, the view is that if you voluntarily recognize the union, right? And I say this to employers, you know, who talk to me offline and we're probably going to get a union. What's the benefit of voluntarily recognizing them? So if you're going to get a union anyway. One benefit of voluntarily recognizing them is they don't have to overpromise during the campaign, right? Um, but again, I don't know about the, the data, um, but you know, that if you don't have a long drag out fight that, you know, that that might make the bargaining process a little bit easier. 
I know Sally's been working on that uh, the issue for the organizing and voluntary recognition of unions in the nonprofit sector. So you are seeing a, a movement for some of the the nonprofit to recognize the union to try to address some of the issues from from the from the employees. And it's always been the argument that, gee, you work in a nonprofit. Are you expecting to get the same kind of wages as you get in the private sector? Well, everybody's got to eat. Everybody's got to live. So they do want to get some of that same same monetary rewards. But a lot of times it's nonprofit. We're driven by the mission of the organization. And it's like, yes, but we still need to put our kids in school. We still need to do this. And they're having to try to work through some of those issues. So there's uh, there is some data, but not as not enough data. Um, I think Sally's working on a grant where she's going to try to collect some of that data. And the other thing I would uh, answer for Maria's question about diversity, equity, diversity, equity and inclusion. Um, you got to remember, like Harry said, the private sector is only about six percent unionized. So 94 percent of the private sector employees need someplace to get help. And the law is written to give you more than one bite of the apple so that you can take it to the courts for some sort of uh, diversity, equity, inclusion. If you're feeling like you were unjustly treated, you can have a lawsuit for that. But you can also do it through the employer. With a union, you're typically more likely or more willing to go through the union for that voice because you have some protection for being fired for just cause. But I think it's, an, I don't know that the federal or private programs have hurt the unions. I think the unions have helped lobby and advocate for that for the entire country, not just the unionized. Because I think the unions were a big, a big uh, proponent for getting those laws passed to begin with. So the union has to think just beyond they have to think beyond their own membership, and many of them think society wide, and they support a lot of these initiatives. So add, that's what I would answer for that. Go ahead, Harry. Yeah, no, I was just going to add. Art's mentioning Sally. That's Sally Klingel, our colleague, who's doing that work uh, along with Katrina Nobles in the nonprofit sector. You could hear from Sally, Katrina, and others on our faculty in the series that Dan's already mentioned. This is the first of a series of webinars about the militancy within the workforce. And then in addition, we have this series that's I mentioned that's targeting particular recent negotiations. Uh, uh, that's the Hollywood discussion that's coming in, in a couple of weeks, followed by a discussion about auto and a discussion of healthcare. So we have multiple series uh, uh, that address different aspects of the issues you're all raising in your questions and we're all commenting on through this discussion. Uh, we, we welcome your participation in these ongoing series. All right, you know, I was just looking at Mary Ellen's last question. I don't know what she was, what of our comments she was referring to, but yeah, more money doesn't seem to be the answer. There it's staffing, which of course costs more money <laughs> for the employer. And again, that's, you know, we're gonna have something on the Kaiser strike. As I think Harry mentioned, that's gonna be one of the things there's now a second, maybe three day strike coming. Um, but yeah, what, how, how are we going to do that? Because that, again, um, it affects the, you know, all of the things that were mentioned, patient care, and just giving them wage increases. That's not, yeah, they want that, but they want, they want staffing. And then how, how do we do that? How do we reform that? And it's not just for healthcare. You had that in the railway sector as well. It wasn't all about the money. The money was not the difficult thing in negotiations. It's, working conditions and, and having that time off, but fantastic questions. And uh, I think we're getting close to time. Thank you, Dan, for asking some great questions and always a pleasure to be on the, on the call with Harry. Thank you all. All right. Thanks everyone. And uh, be sure to check out future communications um, either at arts, you know, Buffalo or online labor studies program or a New York city based uh, open enrollment programs. Stay tuned. Thank you all.